Okay. Gonna... Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right, let's, let us mute ourselves. Brilliant. Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome back to TMS. I think it's our third of the year. So we're starting with a bit of a L'Aquila alumni symposium of weeks. So we have Oriana Newman and Katie Desmond with us this week who are our last year placement students. And I think we have some of the current placement students here as well. So you'll get another perspective for the kind of research that goes on in the labs that you've joined and for everyone else, the labs at the University of L'Aquila. So Katie and Oriana are both undergraduate students at the University of Manchester. They both study biomedical sciences. And as I just mentioned, they both have just completed their placement year in uh, the lab of Professor Anna Maria Tetti, um, working on bone biopathology. And specifically, they're gonna to talk to you today about phenotypic characterization of Cole Carpenter syndrome in a novel mouse model. They are both now back at the University of Manchester, finishing off their degrees. And in the meantime, Oriana has also spent some time in Saskatchewan, Canada, um, working in another lab there, so has gained even more research experience as well since then. So I will hand straight over to you to tell us about what you worked on during your year in L'Aquila and um, yeah, look forward to hearing all about it. Uh, should we leave our cameras on? Can you see us? We can see you. If you're happy to okay. ask, that would be great. Thanks. Okay. Oh, hello. Stop sharing again. Okay. Can you see our screen? Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, that's perfect. Amazing. Okay, so I'll start with this bit. Um, as Annabelle said, we're going to be talking about the phenotypic characterization of Cole Carpenter syndrome in a novel mouse model. So initially I want to discuss um, Cole Carpenter syndrome as a whole. It's a incredibly rare autosomal dominant genetic disease that currently has no cure. Um, it's very limited um, literature currently available um, and uh, yeah, so there's no cure, there's no treatments currently on the market. Uh, what we do have are um, a few case reports of um, the patients that have the disease. Um, so in patients, um, typical symptoms are recurrent non-traumatic fractures, popcorn epilepsies and several other um, skeletal um, deformities that you can see here. And the pictures here, I've just popped some um, x-rays and you can see um, the uh, characteristic popcorn epiphyses here and some of these um, deformities in the bone. And then on the right, this is a young patient um, with Cole Carpenter syndrome. And you can see here she's displaying this characteristic frontal bossing, of, which is um, in the enlarged forehead. Um, some other um, distinctive facial features that you'll see on Patients are um, ocular proptosis um, and uh, bulging of the eyes um, due to these skull deformities. Um, and then on the right, you can see again um, some of the um, skeletal deformities. Um, so that's Cole Carpenter as a whole in the human patients. Um, the cause, the genetic cause of Cole Carpenter syndrome, um, it's uh, P4HB. Um, so this gene encodes prolyl 4 hydroxylase beta subunit. This is a, a, a multifunctional enzyme, also known as protein disulfide isomerase. Um, this is under the umbrella of, confusingly, the protein disulfide isomerase family, um, which carries the same name. Um, this, is, uh, this gene is ubiqui ubiquitously expressed. Um, and in Cole Carpenter syndrome, the patients carry a mutation in this gene it's a point mutation, um, a tyrosine to cysteine substitution at position 393. Um, and you can see in this picture at the bottom, um, normally where we'd have tyrosine, we now have cysteine. Um, you can imagine that this causes some problems um, in proteins as cysteine is um, responsible for disulfide um, bond formation. Um, so having another cysteine in there, you can hypothesize that you'd have some issues later down the line. Um, in protein folding, etc. Um, so that's the the, the molecular genetic um, component responsible for 
the disease. Um, yeah, I'll just talk a little bit about what um, PDI does and why it's important. Um, it's found largely at the endoplasmic reticulum um, in large quantities, and it functions mainly as a um, oxidoreductase and disulfide isomerase. Um, that means that it's responsible for the catalysis of, um, excuse me, I'm not very well at the moment, <coughs> um, of disulfide bond formation. And it's also um, heavily involved in the rearrangement of disulfide bonds in um, nascent polypeptides. Um, it's a redox dependent chaperone. Um, and this means that uh, PDI can detect um, unfolded or not yet folded um, proteins and facilitate their um, proper folding. And this um, inhibits uh, the aggregation of proteins within the cell. Um, and it also, important to this, um, the work that we've been doing this year, um, PDI also tetramerizes to form prolar 4 hydroxylase. Um, this is important in collagen synthesis. It um, hydro uh, hydroxylates prolar residues in pro, um, pro collagen and um, uh, facilitates the conversion into mature collagen. Therefore, it's um, incredibly important in collagen synthesis. Um, this will be important later on um, when we're discussing some of the um, experiments we did on collagen. So that's a little bit on me uh, for me of the, the molecular background, if you will, um, behind the disease. So, so um, I was going to talk about the aims for this project, but first I just want to mention like why has this lab picked this disease? And uh, the lab, the bone biopathology lab, has a history of working with rare bone disease, and it notably has just. Uh, closed, closed or is closing a project on a monogenic uh, bone disease with a kind of, I wouldn't say similar presentation, but similar genetic presentation uh, called ADO2. Um, and they developed a successful treatment that's gone to industry for that disease. So um, they have experience in developing uh, therapies for monogenic bone diseases. Um, and then additionally, Cole Carpenter's, the Cole Carpenter syndrome is very rare, but um, we think it has to do with collagen uh, processing and uh, bone formation uh, with the co collagen type 1. And there are many uh, rare diseases that involve problems with collagen processing. Um, and together, though they are all rare, together they form quite a large group of patients um, in need of therapy. Um, so by looking at Cole Carpenter syndrome and developing a therapy effective there, you might find uh, a therapy that's effective in a whole bunch of diseases. And so you're not just curing the small group of Cole Carpenter syndrome patients, you're curing or providing a treatment for a very large group of patients instead. Um, so. The aims of this project then are to first understand how the P4HB mutation affects the homeostasis of the skeletal and non-skeletal tissues. Um, a fairly general um, overview of trying to characterize the Cole Carpenter uh, phenotype. And then the second aim is to identify the effect of the mutation on the protein disulfur dull high sulfide isomerase subcellular localization, uh, the intracellular trafficking of type 1 procollagen, and the intracellular trafficking of homeostasis, which is essentially just looking at the cellular phenotype, if you like. Um, so what's going on in the cells that is then going to lead to the tissue deformities or the problems that we see on the kind of macro level? Um, yeah, if you like these aims of one and two are the what's going on on the macroscopic level and what's going on on a more microscopic level. Um, and then the third aim is a sort of future aim, which is to treat the P4HB uh, mice, so the model for the disease, which I'll get onto, uh, with different experimental approaches and investigate the potential therapeutic options for human patients. So um, by looking at our model organism and finding uh, treatments and testing a whole variety of treatments in them, could we find one which is 
appropriate then to take forward into studies on human cell tissues and eventually uh, people. Um, this is important to do first in mice because it's much uh, less expensive to do in mice and uh, ethically easier, let's say, than jumping straight to trying a whole bunch of things on people. Um, so, firstly then, to start the project, you have to develop a mouse model or any model, but in this case, uh, this lab works with mice, is experienced with mice. Um, so, in collaboration with Polygene, uh, what they did was they took embryonic stem cells from uh, a, let's say, wild type mouse strain, and they gave them the point mutation in the P4HB gene that leads to Cole Carpenter syndrome, and they also gave them a neomycin resistant gene. They then used geneticin to select for those cells that were su successfully mutated, put them into a blastocyst. Um, which is, I guess, an early embryo. And the early embryo is then put into a surrogate mother. Surrogate mother gives birth to a chimera mouse, which is, uh, it's got cells that are not mutated and cells that are mutated uh, both types. Uh, these are bred with, uh, these are called deletoma mice, which take away the kind of the antibiotic resistant gene, the neomycin resistance gene, and the kind of additions that you put in to get the mutation into your uh, mutant mice, if you like, and breed them together and you get the F1 generation, which you then test with PCR and gene sequencing to find out if they are uh, P4HB mutant mice. Um, and those mice are positive are uh, your selected mice. They are your, your mouse model, the first generation which you then, of course, breed together to create subsequent generations. Um, awesome. So uh, before we arrived in the lab, there was, and to get the grant for this study, uh, Dr. Antonio Marizzi and his uh, associates and students uh, did preliminary uh, studies. So they generated their mass model and then did some preliminary work to uh, provide evidence that this was a good mouse model, that uh, this was a useful model, and that we could, um, that this project would be a good project uh, to be funded, in essence. Um, so they used 12 month old male mice, uh, three of the wild type mice, and three of the Cole Carpenter mutant mice. And they did um, bone phenotype investigations and some uh, extra, some cellular, <laughs> extracellular investigations as well. So the first thing they did was a micro CT, which is a CT scan, uh, same as humans get in hospitals, um, but, much, but smaller for mice, essentially. Um, and they found that with these scans and subsequent computer analysis that in the Cole Carpenter mutant mice, the bone volume was decreased and the number of trabecular. So uh, if you can see on these pit images, the kind of uh, white hatching in the center of the bone are the trabeculae. And in the image from the mutant mice, this is much decreased. So the trabecular number is decreased, and that was confirmed by the computer analysis. This is indicative that uh, there is less bone decreased bone osteopenia in the Cole Carpenter syndrome mouse model. So it's a indication that our mouse model is working and it's correct. Um, they also did bone indentation testing, which is where you press uh, press into the bone. A carefully calibrated needle presses the bone and sees how far it it can press in, if you like. Um, obviously, bone's pretty hard. You're not supposed to be able to press bone down. So if it's poor quality, then your needle is going to be able to press further. And that is the case in the Cole Carpenter mice. The indentation different distance was increased, which indicates poor bone quality in the CCS. 
maps. So our mouse model is working. They also did the cellular analysis. Um, so the osteoblasts and osteoclasts, the uh, cells which are involved in making and uh, breaking bone, uh, breaking it down and the kind of cycling of building and uh, yeah, taking away bone to replace with new bone. What's the word? Um, resorption, <laughs> yes. Um, so they did histomorphometric analyses where they took sections of tibiae and stained them uh, to count the osteoblast and osteoclast number and also analyzed the surface area of the cells versus the surface area of the whole section. And this was reduced in the osteoblast, but not of, there's no apparent difference in the osteoclasts. They also did gene expression analyses for osteoblast differentiation, differentiation markers. Um, and you can see these graphs on the bottom left. Um, and this is significantly reduced for all those uh, osteoblast differentiation markers. But um, the a kind of equivalent serum analyses looking at the bone resorption biomarker CCX1 uh, there was no apparent differences there. So we can, from this, uh, you can assume or it suggests that uh, the problem in the Cole Carpenter syndrome, at least in the mice that we have created, is uh, coming from the osteoblast cells. Cool. So on to then what I did. So the first thing I did was the micro CT analysis, this time looking at a larger group of mice and in two age groups, or at least I have complete sets of data for two age groups, one mice age one month and mice age six months uh, in future. And I started looking at mice who are aged three months and 12 months as well. Um, and we had five mice in every uh, category. So five female wild types, five female uh, mutant mice, age one month, etc. Um, so you can see here we've got the micro CT images of the bone, and I'm not sure if the pictures are big enough on your screens, but you can see here that the trabecular number is decreased, and this is also the second image is a cross section of the cortical bone, so taken from a little bit lower than our trabecular analysis along the tibia. Um, and you can see that there is a decreased uh, cortical volume. The bone looks thinner in the wild type mice. Cool. And then with the computer analysis, we can see that there is significant decreases in bone volume. Uh, normalized for tissue volume, that's what that means, bone volume over tissue volume. And there's um, significant differences in the trabecular number as well. And for the male mice, there is a significant difference in the cortical bone volume uh, with a, a trend appearing for the females, though this isn't a significant trend. Um, on then to the six months, you can see in these images that the bone is bigger, it's more developed, it's thicker. Um, and the, in the cortical images, it's less apparent that there might be uh, thinning or less bone in the mutant mice, but you can see from the trabecular images there is still visibly less uh, trabecular bone volume. Okay, so in then in our computer analysis, this time we didn't find significant reductions in bone volume, um, but we found trends and it's also worth mentioning that in our male mice there was a significant outlier without the presence of this uh, mouse. This is, in fact, a significant difference in bone volume. Um, so perhaps in future to kind of work out uh, what's happening with this character, you might want to. So we re-genotype this mice. It is a CCS mouse. Um, but uh, we might want to think about things like uh, variants of expression or 
uh, incomplete penetrance, maybe? We were talking about this um, to explain why there's no real phenotype here. And then also, of course, increase the sample number so we can say for uh, truly that this is an outlying data point or not. Um, yes, we had a significantly decreased trabecular thickness, which we didn't have in the one month mice, um, and no differences in trabecular number, um, which shows that age is having effect on the kind of phenotypic characteristics that we're seeing in the different mice. And um, it's, yeah, I think in future, when we see the kind of data for the three months and 12 months, we'll have a better picture of how the phenotype developed over different age groups and over time um, because obviously these mice are growing over the kind of one month to six month period they're becoming adults but then also the disease is changing its presentation and I think we've got some things to say about that later as well uh, gender differences that began to appear in our data um, so then I did serum analyses using ELISA's um, ELISA assays to have a look at these um, markers of osteoclast function and osteoblast function. Um, so in the one month mice, um, we saw uh, no significant differences for any of the osteoclast markers, CTX1 and TRAP, and then CTX1 over TRAP as a kind of uh, simple test to look at. Uh, function over number of cells. Um, but we did see a trend in the female and a significant decrease in the serum concentration of PIMP, which is a marker of osteoblast function. And that kind of ties back nicely to the preliminary data, which suggested that it was osteoblasts and not osteoclasts that were being affected in this disorder. And then in the six month mice, we have the same for the females uh, with no significant um, effects appearing in the osteoclast biomarkers. Um, but this time there's also no effect in the PIMP. Um, and in the male, there is a significant decrease of serum concentration of PIMP osteoblast biomarker. And also one in the CTX, which is a marker for osteoclast. Uh, function. Um, something what we thought about is maybe there is a gender difference of presentation, something I mentioned a little bit before, um, between that becomes apparent as the mice get older. Um, we're going to talk about that in a little bit in our conclusions, you know, thinking about what might be happening there. Obviously, particularly going from one month to six months, mice have then, uh, they've gone through puberty, they're adults, so they have definite hormone differences and developmental differences that might not be apparent when they're a when they're younger. Um, another explanation for why we might have an osteoclast biomarker difference here is that um, osteoblasts and osteoclasts regulate each other. So perhaps if we're having a significant effect on osteoblasts, this is then going to produce a knock-on effect in our osteoclasts. So things to think about. OK, then looking a little bit more at the extraskeletal phenotype, I looked at the kidneys and the pancreas as I did an overview, let's say, of those. Um, and the reason we picked these two is because PDI, as Katie said, is a ubiquitous protein. It's uh, expressed everywhere um, and it's been linked to other pathological conditions. Um, all sorts, cardiovascular, metabolic, but there's a spe specific evidence uh, has shown up in the literature to suggest that PDI is involved in the regulation of renal angiotensin type 2 uh, receptor, which is in the kidney, and uh, that PDI is involved in pro-insulin secretion by the beta cells in the pancreas islets. So that is why we uh, chose kidney and pancreas to look at. Uh, initially in our kind of extraskeletal exploration. Um, so I did is H&E staining, hematoxylin and eosin staining, which is the common histological stain, uh, very useful to look at 
the structure of organs. Uh, you can see it shows the cells very nicely and the kind of, yeah, architectural features, if you like, of tissues. Um, so in the one month kidneys, then we had uh, no differences, no pathological signs in the female, the male, the wild type and our coal carpenter mice. Uh, these kidneys all look the same. They all looked healthy. However, in the six months we had in both female and male and wild type and coal carpenter, we had pathological signs uh, such as you can see by these yellow arrows, glomeruli shrinkage. So these are the glomeruli. They're supposed to look like this, nice and kind of uh, continuous with the tissue or maybe a tiny, tiny gaps. You see, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but I am pointing at things with it. <laughs> I've just realized that you might not be able to see that. Um, okay, <laughs> I've just been pointing at things and not check that you can see that. Um, so you can see the glomeruli shrinkage here and here. And we also had cell precipitates. So um, we think that these are immune cell precipitates um, that have collected and coagulated in the kidney. Um, you see them there as well. And there's also these vacuole, vacuoles that have appeared. Um, I didn't put a slide in for this because we are under time pressure, but these did flag in the preliminary data as potentially an effect of coal carpenter syndrome. But here we have them both in the wild type and the coal carpenter mice. So we can't draw any conclusions from that as that all these pathological signs are present, uh, equally present in both our wild type and coal carpenter mice. And so uh, as a lab, we had a thought about why this might be and some measures were taken to make sure the mice were healthy. And there are, uh, I think, moves in the future to repeat this data to make sure that we're, you know, none of these pathological signs are coming from any sort of confounding disease, say the mice have picked up a virus, like they got a cold or something, you know, we don't want that. Cool. So moving on then to the pancreas, I did the same H and E thing. And you'll notice that it's come out slightly different color. Um, that's because of the uh, probably changes setting to the microscope and also the fact that these were done later in the year. So uh, the we've changed the reagents by then. So because you're supposed to change them over quite recent, often regularly. Uh, so that means the uh, composition and the age of our reagents are slightly different. So they've come out slightly more purple this time. Not a problem at all. You can still see all the cells and here, I should have marked them with arrows, are the islets of the pancreas. Um, these are not the best images, I do apologize. Um, and when we're looking at the H&E staining, just having a look at the tissue, you can't see any particular um, deformations of the tissue. And yeah, there's no obvious structural uh, problems. But then when you do, when well, I did, <laughs> Um, some counting of the number of islets uh, in the tissue sections and uh, measuring of the islets. I used image J for that. Uh, you see actually that in the male mice, there is a significant decrease in the number of islets per millimeter squared and the size of those islets uh, as a percentage of the total area. Uh, what could this mean then? Um, it could be indicative of some kind of cellular dysfunction or developmental problems in the pancreas. It could be um, an indicator of a metabolic disease. So a step, a next step would be to look at the uh, amount of serum insulin maybe to see if insulin levels are the same or normal in the mice, uh, which we did start doing but did not complete, so I haven't included it here. Um, so uh, that's an interesting result. Further investigation is required to see if we have some extracellular phenotype, pancreatic phenotype emerging here as well. Um, that's the end of my section then. And I'll hand over to Katie first. Thank you. OK, so uh, uh, my side of the project um, was to look um, specifically at the cellular and subcellular um, mechanisms behind Carpenter syndrome. Um, 
so initially I looked at, um, we started, we've done these um, all on osteoblasts. So I looked at osteoblast differentiation. These are various markers of osteoblast differentiation. Um, for example, out, you can um, monitor um, uh, the formation of the matrix and rank, um, rank ligand and OPG work together to um, stop excessive bone resorption. Um, just a few examples. So they kind of measure how well the osteoblast is working as an osteoblast. Um, here you can see two separate graphs for this. This is um, a real-time uh, PCR. So this looks at the uh, gene expression of each of these markers. So we're looking at the, the level of mRNA. Um, on the left, you can see I've done my experiments with both the male and female mice together, looking at the difference between the expression in the wild type and the mutated osteoblast. And then on the right, this was um, done uh, quite a bit later in the project um, when the differences started emerging in between genders in Oriana's results. Um, I revisited these experiments to um, uh, to repeat them um, with the male and female sample separately. Um, and yeah, so we can see here on the on the left, there are no significant differences. Uh, this was done with three experiments. So it's a, a full complete experiment on the, on the right. That's two experiments, one done by myself and then one done later by my supervisor, um, Dr. Baruti. Um, and yeah, we can see, but there are no differences and we can't make any comments yet on the 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 one with the male and female separately, but we can see there are some potential differences emerging uh, between the male and the female mice in how much you can see the phenotype, essentially. Um, so in this case, we can see, say, unranked ligand and OPG, those two markers on the right-hand side, that the um, uh, for the females, the phenotype is stronger, uh, uh, one way of saying it. So rank ligand is um, upregulated more and OPG PG downregulated more in the um, in the female. Um, obviously, we can't make any complete conclusions on this because it's just two experiments, um, and none of them are significant in comparison to the wild type as of yet. Um, but this was at the gene expression level. Often, you find this um, a large def uh, deviation in in the genetic uh, analyses. So next, I looked at the the protein level. Um, so I used uh, a technique called the Western block. This um, you're looking uh, you use antibodies to detect um, a protein um, that you've put onto a membrane in a short version because I don't wish it's uh, stress for time. Um, so I'm looking at the expression of PDI in both the wild type and the mutated um, osteoblast, and we can see here that there we didn't see any. Uh, significant change in the this is, this is essentially the amount of PDI in both of the types of cells um, yeah um, so we are normalized this with um, beta actin which is a cytoskeletal protein um, resident to the osteoblast um, so we know we hypothesized from this that the it wasn't the amount of PDI that is different between the two cells two cell types so the next steps um, a lot of my uh, results, a lot of my work was done on setting up some experiments. Um, so I'd done some and I've got some completed experiments and then some uh, moving into the next steps now that I've left. But I did some setup. So I thought I'd explain because this is the kind of nature of our projects um, this year. Um, and it's useful for the lab in the future. And um, so the next steps they would like to look at where PDR is located. Um, and this will be done using immunofluorescence techniques um, to compare the location of PDI and other markers. I've written some down here, uh, various markers for the ER, the, the Golgi apparatus, uh, lysosomes, cytoskeletal proteins, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I've got on the next slide, so these are some of the images. I've just picked a selection um, of the, the markers that I set up. So you can see the top, the negative control. Um, in this case, you use um, antibodies um, with a fluorophore, and then you can um, visualize the fluorescence in order to visualize the, the uh, marker of interest. Um, so to prove that we're looking at a specific protein and not just any protein in general, you do a negative control without the primary antibody. Um, 
so it's not looking for any protein in, in particular. And you can see that we don't have any um, fluorescence um, in this image. And then on the others, you have both the, um, the primary and the um, fluorescence conjugated secondary antibodies together. And you can see um, the specific markers that we're looking for. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the, uh, the reason I have PDI and the other markers in different colors is because we're going to do, they're going to do co-localization assays in the future. So you, you'd need to look at, say, PDI and beta actin together, for example. Um, uh, so two different colours. So then um, red will show up PDI, green will show up the beta actin. And then in that case, you can see, um, are they in the similar position? Same with other markers. And then this way, you can look at the resident proteins and compare this to PDI to see if our mutated form is in a different position in the cell than it's supposed to be. Um, as I said in the beginning, PDI is an ER resident protein, so it should be found primarily at the ER. Um, so that's the next step for this section of the, the project. Um, I also looked and um, did some analyses for collagen expression. Um, so this was the initial, again, with the Western block technique. So I'm looking at, at a protein level, um, the expression of collagen in both the wild type and the mutated osteoblasts. Um, in this case, um, so this is kind of split into four. In the top left, I've got a ponso staining. That's used to um, stain total. So you have your membrane that you've put your transferred proteins onto from the osteoblasts. Um, and then you can stain the total protein and use this um, to normalize for your collagen um, analysis. Um, so same with the beta actin in the, in the previous experiments, you want the, the beta actin and the ponso staining to show that both of the, the protein samples are um, the same, um, so that what you're looking at, you're, you're looking at the changes in collagen expression, you're not looking, at, there's no confounding variables. Um, so on the top right, I've got an image of the, the Western blot itself. Um, so we can see um, from the picture um, that in the, so the, the left-hand lane is the wild type and in the right-hand lane, um, I have the mutated form. Um, we can see that pro-collagen appears to be increased and mature collagen appears to be decreased in the mutated form. Um, I have the two graphs for this at the bottom. Um, so it's been quantified and there's been um, several experiments done. Um, there aren't any significant differences that we found in the collagen expression, but we can see some clear trends between these graphs that um, we have increased expression of pro-collagen in the uh, mutated form and decreased expression of mature collagen. As I mentioned in the beginning, uh, PDI is really important for collagen synthesis and the hydroxylation of the prolar residues in the pro-collagen in order to um, form the mature collagen. Um, so if this was um, validated with other techniques and this, this, um, these changes were found to be significant, we could hypothesize that the mutated form of PDI perhaps isn't performing its role very effectively in um, hydroxyl um, hydroxylation um, and that there's some issue in the post-translational post modification of collagen within the cell. Um, again, this is just a hypothesis at this stage, but there seems to be a trend emerging here. Um, steps, another next steps type uh, style here. Um, would be to look at collagen secretion. So that was collagen expressed, uh, uh, collagen expression within the cell. And, and next would to be to look at the osteoblast ability to secrete collagen into the extracellular matrix and to do this, um, to analyze this without the bias of the osteoblast there. Um, so we decided on a method for this would be to um, plate the osteoblast and treat them with ascorbic acid. Um, this is used a lot in the lab. Ascorbic acid is used a lot in the in the lab. It facilitates the different um, differentiation of osteoblasts. Um, so initiates um, all the markers we discussed before for osteoblasts working as osteoblasts essentially. So treat them with ascorbic acids to ensure that we're working with osteoblasts. Leave them in culture, um, and then take the the osteoblast cultures that we've got that are now be um, secreting collagen because they're osteoblasts. Um, to cellularize them to remove the cells, so we're left with just collagen. 
and then quantify the collagen expression with um, the I'll discuss later within the um, in the um, I'm losing the word quantify the collagen expression. Um, so when setting up this experiment, there are a few questions that we looked at. So I did quite a few different variations of this um, before doing moving on to the experimental material. Um, we wanted to know how long to leave the cells in culture. So I did a, um, a, a different time point, so 72 hours and seven days, and see how long uh, we needed to leave the cells in culture in order to have enough collagen um, secreted to analyze probably. Um, uh, we'd settled on seven days for this one. So in the experimental um, uh, analyses, we'll be using seven days. Uh, also wanted to know how long to leave the decellularized solution, decellularization solution on for. So when removing the cells, we use a tris base um, solution to remove remove the cells um, in the in the plate. Uh, we want to know how long to leave it. So I did uh, an hour, two hours, um, and a, on the you kind of shake it for a while to ensure all the cell, uh, cellular components have been removed. Uh, for this, we settled on two hours. Hours. So we did um, for each of these experiments. I would do um, do a variation, a, a different versions, uh, stain with DAPI. So this um, stains the nuclei of the cells, and you can see whether the cells are there or not. Um, and we decided on two hours for this. And then any other modifications? I did a few different ones. For example, we found that um, there, uh, with the amount of washes in the in initial um, protocol. We were left with some cellular fragments that we could see via the DAPI staining. Um, so I increased some washes um, to ensure that when we started the experimental work, that the um, experiment was looking for what we wanted to. Um, so that was setting up for this experiment. And this is the first result we have for the collagen secretion analysis. It's just one experiment. I didn't have time to, to get a full complete set before I left, but we managed first um, the first experimental um, result, and we can see here if this continues in this trend, um, a decrease in collagen secretion in the mutated um, osteoblasts. So this implies that we're having a problem with collagen secretion when the mutation is present in the osteoblasts. Um, as I said again earlier, um, this might have a role where um, this might be caused by this mutation in PDI. Um, it is not working properly in its role as a collagen chaperone protein. Um, I will mention it whilst I'm on this one as well, um, that we can see potentially a difference in the male and female again. Um, but we would need three experiments in order to, to decide whether this was significant or not. Um, but maybe a difference in male and female again here. Um, okay, and then the last thing that I looked at was ER stress. Um, so when you have um, a problem with um, protein folding or secretion of proteins, you'll, you will have ER stress um, due to a build of these unfolded or misfolded proteins within the cell. So um, similar with uh, some of my work I did earlier, I started um, by analysing this at the level of the mRNA. Um, so this was a um, gene expression analysis. Um, again, I started with the male and female together. This is when we first began the project um, and everything seemed to be pretty flat and no difference between the wild type and the mutated osteoblast um, with regards to um, the expression of um, the ER stress markers. Um, but again, we could see this quite um, large um, standard deviation. And, and then when we I did this separately for male and female later on, um, we can see that there's quite a, a difference, it appears, between the male and female in the um, expression of these different markers. Um, that could be potentially a, a reason for the, the differences in um, deviation. <coughs> so, next I moved on to looking at the protein level. So you can see there's a bit of a pattern forming. Um, here, I looked at both ER stress and cell autophagy um, with B, uh, BIP1 and P62. BIP1 is involved in the ER stress pathway, and P62 is involved in cell autophagy. So this is the um, recognition and breakdown of misfolded or unfolded proteins um, within the cell. 
um, we can see on the left, there's a trend. It's not significant, but there is a trend that we have increased expression of BIP1 at the protein level in the mutated osteoblasts. And we can see on the right uh, that there's a significant difference um, that there is um, increased expression of P62 in the mutated osteoblasts. So um, ER stress, I should mention here, it can either be um, physiological or it can be pathological. Um, so ER stress is used by the cell um, in case you have mis uh, misfolded proteins um, to break down those proteins and get them out of the way. In that case, it is a physiological response, but ER stress can also become pathological when you have a buildup of this, these unfolded or misfolded proteins um, within the cell and um, essentially it becomes too much for the cell to handle, the, the um, pathway is saturated. And in that case, it becomes pathological and can lead to cell death. Um, so yeah, in this case, we can see that there is um, signs that uh, P62 is um, increased in the mutated. So um, I should say we'll have to um, uh, re uh, revalidate these uh, with other techniques. Uh, for example, in the immunofluorescence, we could look at um, BIP1 expression again and then um, see if any trend emerges there. Um, it's always good to look at it in multiple techniques um, to prove the same point. Okay, uh, so some conclusions as Oriana was discussing, um, we've seen that the mice are osteopenic and there are gender differences emerging in both the bone phenotyping, some of the extraskeletal um, uh, work that Oriana did, and in some of the work that I did with the um, real-time PCR. Um, I, I didn't do any of the Western blocks with the um, male and female separately, but potentially there could be some differences there, and that might be something to look at in the future. Um, we also found further, further evidence to support an issue with the osteoblast and not the osteoclast. This, again, was what Oriana was discussing. Um, and I move forward with the osteoblast in my um, in my analyses instead of the osteoclast. Um, uh, again, Ariana mentioned the evidence to suggest an extraskeletal um, phenotype, and this was with the H and E stain in with the kidneys and pancreas. And then towards my, uh, there's an indication that collagen expression could be affected by the mutation that was with the Western blot. And then uh, moving forward with the collagen secretion assays. Um, and there's an evidence to suggest an increase in ER stress and cell autophagy. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so future directions for this would be further investigation of the um, CCS phenotype. So this is right at the beginning of the project, um, Ariana and I's work, um, and they might look to uh, look at the mice in different age groups, as Ariana said, with three months to 12 months. You want to check in with anything carry on <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, yeah, you're, um, yeah. Um, we're doing very much forms the beginning of this project the basis for uh further work we're doing all the kind of uh we did lots of setups as you know we discussed and yeah, that's some kind of work and groundwork is the term i think looking at um kind of big names like all our biomarkers are kind of the standard set, if you like, that you would look at to look at bone phenotypes um, and osteoblasts and osteoblasts, you know, rather than uh, this can form the basis for looking and finding more specific pathways or more specific, um, you know, tissue problems and protein problems. Yeah, for example, with the, um, the ER stress work, um, typically you look at bit form first, that's like the mass of protein and the three different um, ER stress pathways. So if you identify any upregulation or downregulation of BIP1, then you might want to look at um, which pathway might be involved specifically afterwards. Um, so we've kind of looked at the... Yeah, I mean, the, the title grandma. is the characterising the phenotype. Yes. <laughs> trying to characterise rather than uh, yet explain the identify. phenotype, maybe. Um, yeah, so further in investigation, there's lots of opportunity to move forward with um, finishing the, um, to have the three experiments and uh, with the male and female separately, looking into the gender differences that have started to emerge, uh, particularly with mine, with the collagen secretion, um, and looking at the um, formation of the matrix um, would be some further um, 
further things to investigate. And then eventually, uh, if all goes to plan, this would be fantastic to develop a therapy um, for CCS patients if you can um, identify the molecular me mechanism involved um, and target this for a therapy. For example, the um, the cell autophagy, if you could um, target that for a potential therapy for, for patients. Um, again, that's the future plan, but it would be nice. Future, future plan. <laughs> um, so, yes, thank you very much for listening. Thanks for hearing our talk. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was a really fantastic presentation and I think a really great example of how key optimization is for a project and what a project really means because it's not just coming in and, and having everything ready. Oh, my screen's put us in the forest. Yeah. Yes, I'm very confused. <laughs> um, yeah, really, it, that's, that's the truth of science is actually you spend most of your time at the beginning of a project optimizing all of these things. So you, I think you've had a really realistic experience of what this work can be and, and what a PhD is like and what further research is like where you really dive into it yourselves. So congratulations, because you've done Thank a huge amount of work at a really difficult stage of a project. So massive, massive, well done. Thank we you. have it's, oh, sorry. questions. Um, so I can see Michaela has her hand up. So I'll hand over to Michaela for the qu first question. Sorry, I'm just going to step away to plug my computer in. Oh, oh yes, let's uh, not have that die in the middle. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Michaela, have we got you? Hello. There we go. Great. Yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you. So, uh, I get perfect. I have a curiosity. So, since, um, since you say that there is a, seems to be a difference between uh, male and female, did you read something about the difference in the uh, gender frequency of the pathology in humans? Um, yes, we were reading some of the um, the case reports and it seems to be that there are more male patients. And that would line up with a lot of um, Ariana's data seems to say that the bone, of, uh, bone phenotype is more um, uh, more strongly expressed, more, more significant in the male patients than the female. The one that I noticed for mine was in the um, was it osteoblast differentiation, I think it seems to be more prominent in the female, but this was at the gene gene level, which can often be quite variable, um, and you'd need some future and to look at it in more deeply to, to have any conclusions, but we, we thought that was quite interesting as well. I didn't catch the question, but it's also worth noting that none of the patients 